Good afternoon, everybody. Hope you had a great lunch. And we are ready to kick off the second half of Pragma. We got two more talks to go and two more demos. And uh, this is the 50% mark. So let's uh, buckle in and just begin right away with our next upcoming interview. So for our next talk, and that's our third talk of the day, we want to bring on Lucas from SAFE. A lot of you have used SAFE before. Uh, if you are part of a DAO, if you care about custodying your assets and managing a lot more securely uh, what you're holding, uh, whether it's your NFTs or your money or everything in between, you have heard of SAFE. But there's a lot more to SAFE than just a multi-sig. And there's a lot more history to how SAFE got to where it is. And to talk about all of that, we're going to bring on Lucas and cover a lot more of these themes. So please join me in welcoming Lucas and giving a big round of applause. Back in my day, this used to be called Gnosis Safe. And uh, a lot of people who are coming into this space now know it just as safe. So I'd love to kind of start off by having you talk about the history of how this came to be a product. Tell us about Gnosis Safe, what, was, what that was like, the decision to sort of go spend more time on this and, and this eventual brand to safe. How much time do we have? Because it's actually quite a long story. In the next five minutes. All right. Um, yeah, in five minutes, I'd like to go back maybe to um, the origin of SAFE being part of, of Gnosis because we did this, this spin-off last year, but the, the origin of the project goes back way, way before that. Um, yeah, Gnosis was originally a research project within Consensus. It was actually the first spoke from Consensus, the first project that then from within Consensus got spun off. Um, what Gnosis wanted to do is uh, build prediction markets. So market mechanisms that allow for crowdsourcing of knowledge in order to have better informed decision making. Um, and yeah, that was kind of the, the goal of, of Gnosis. They did the, the ICO uh, to, to fund this project. And when they did the ICO, they suddenly had a lot of digital assets, ether they had to, to safeguard. And there was not really a good solution out there to do so. Um, you don't want to have like a lot of ether just sitting on a single private key, uh, being managed by multiple people. You don't know like when, when a transaction is made, who triggered this transaction and, and such. Um, so Gnosis had saw this, this need of building a, a tool that allows for uh, coordination around, around assets, uh, which ended up being the Gnosis multisig. And it was really just like an internal tool Gnosis did to, to, to safeguard these ICO uh, assets, but they ended up open sourcing the project. And it happened that a lot of these ICOs back then in 2017 uh, had a similar problem and they just started using Gnosis Multisig. And uh, as things go, if you open source something and someone else starts using it, uh, suddenly you have people having feature requests, you want People want to have like a hosted version of this product. You, uh, yeah, you have to maintain it, build it out. Uh, so Gnosis started building a, a team around this project uh, to just. And by this time, everything is still internal. Is that? Yeah, I, I mean, it was already used externally, but uh, it, this was exactly this transition period uh, where Gnosis saw this is actually something that the market needs. We need to put a team behind it. We need to productize the Gnosis multisig, um, and then the next step was. This is very valuable for teams, but it also has a lot of potential for individuals uh, that want to have more secure way to, to custody their assets. Uh, so that was when Gnosis Safe was born, which was the next version of Gnosis Multisig, new contracts, more gas efficient, like many improvements there. Uh, initially, mainly with the purpose to bringing this to retail users, to individuals, uh, but then still like the this, this team use case of having multiple people store assets together was still quite important, uh, so SAFE was also adopted there. Um, yeah, and at, at the same time, Gnosis did a lot of other things. Uh, they started, uh, or the Kickstarter did the DXDAO, they took over the uh, the parity client's development, then uh, opened Ethereum, they created new like market mechanisms, which then uh, was initially research and then developed into CowSwap now. 
uh, and kind of loaded itself with so many different projects. And then there was this opportunity to merge also with, with XDAI, which is a, a separate layer one, which has DAI as its native coin and uh, cheaper transaction fees. Uh, and so there were just too many things on the plate for Gnosis. And the decision was then made that like the future of Gnosis is going to be Gnosis Chain, so formerly XDAI. And the other projects that were too big to be part of this uh, Gnosis Chain vision uh, had to spin off, had to develop their own identity, uh, go outside of, of Gnosis because they're, um, I wouldn't say they were standing in the way, but they were definitely, it's harder to balance multiple projects. So Safe had like a huge potential. So they didn't just want to close it down, but they, they said it has its life on its own. So beginning of last year, then this decision was made from, from Gnosis DAO to spin off the, the Safe project. And then there was the question, like, how do we call this thing? <laughs> because people actually call- it's Always been Gnosis Safe. <laughs> people call Gnosis Safe just Gnosis in many times. Um, so like I, I use Gnosis to custody my, my assets, but the idea is that when people say I built on Gnosis, they should mean I built on Gnosis chain, uh, because that's what the, the now Gnosis is going to focus on. Um, and we want to prevent a little bit this, this confusion also around, around this. Uh, so we said Gnosis, it was nice for the time being, but now we need to focus on safe. And it, it is a very hard transition to make because, I mean, People call it Gnosis, also safe. Like it, it requires a lot of ed education that you uh, associate with safe, not this physical safe, but this new digital safe that we create. Um, I think it's it's a process, and we start seeing a little bit the the benefits of having our own identity now and our own project. Um, yeah. Also, Cowswap, by the way, also did its spin-off uh, last year, so that that also happened and. Um, yeah, it's still like a bigger Gnosis family in a sense, but there's, uh, yeah, the safe now is completely independent. Well, that's awesome. We're going to dig into uh, what does that actually mean. But uh, no, you are right because I've had to remind myself multiple times to not say Gnosis safe on stage accidentally because I've just been so used to it over the past few years. But, and uh, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not quite easy. You started off as a multi-sig kind of internal team. Tool became public, open source, and then people started using it. And that means you were kind of focus on priorities for people at that time, and now multiple years have passed. Is, is there something that you feel like people still misunderstand about what, what SAFE is? I think definitely one thing that uh, SAFE, because it has so much traction within teams and DAOs and everywhere where multiple people coordinate around assets, uh, it's often mistaken as a, as a DAO tooling or as a, like, a, yeah, uh, like a company solution. But uh, I think also if, if you look at the stats, uh, there's about two and a half million safes out there. More than half of that are controlled by individual users. Um, actually, interestingly, the everyone who did this onboarding with WorldCoin today, they actually use a safe because WorldApp deploys a safe for every user. Um, and I think that's something which will uh, become more more clear over the next months as well as we explore more the opportunities of account abstraction and smart accounts that this there's so much more than just multi-sig that's enabled through safe uh, because also if you look at uh, just pure smart contract architecture there's like this multi-sig component in there so there's there can be one or multiple private keys that control a safe uh, but then it allows to add uh, additional functionality through plugins uh, we call them modules guards and fallback handlers that extend the functionality of a safe and that can make it extremely useful, not just in a team where you have multiple private keys, but even if you just have one private key, but you might have a module that gives the user like a spending limit that they can use like a certain amount of assets per day or uh, like a guard that protects you from certain interactions with like a, a deny listed amount, like a list of, of, of contracts. So there's like a lot of more functionality be beyond just the multi-sig part. Um, so I would say, uh, biggest misconceptions is that SAFE is more than just a team solution and SAFE is more than just a multi-sig part. And uh, that sort of kind of opens up the whole platform piece, uh, which I want to talk about in a second. Um, 2.5 million deployments of the contract, that's that's a big number. 
And uh, especially in the kind of context of our ecosystem and where we are, like that's that's a lot. Are there uh, any other stats that uh, you're proud of for uh, for how Safe is doing? I mean, there's there's a few stats that definitely boggle my my own mind because um, right now there's about seventy billion dollars worth of assets being secured through Safe. Um, and no big deal. <laughs> if you compare this, this is roughly five percent of the entire crypto market cap. In, including Bitcoin, which you cannot even store. Oh, so not, not Ethereum, just a crypto market. Yeah, yeah. that's but, I mean, take this with a pinch of salt because on, on safe, there's also assets that are not part of the traditional market cap, so not uh, like circulating supply. And like, there's a lot of these assets that are counted in there, but still like there's ton, ton of uh, value being secured. And even if you look beyond just the regular ERC-20 native coins, there's a uh, lot of NFTs secured through safe about like more than 10% of all crypto punks or uh, me ladies or all the kind of the major collections, if you look at the stats, usually are on safes. Um, also more than 10% of all USDC is currently on, on safe. And that's a big number. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Well, well, the most obvious question I have with this is, well, that's, that's a lot of money uh, being trusted with uh, the same code. How, uh, how do you think about security, especially as more assets get custody and, and kind of what's your thinking and policy and framework around security? Yeah, I mean, we were also lucky that all this value wasn't just secured overnight. Um, and it took people a lot of time to really trust the, the safe contracts. I think the first three years, it was always below like 10 million maybe in total. I mean, this was also pre last bull market, uh, but then People always were still having in mind the, the parity hack and like putting money on, on a smart contract wasn't as common as after after DeFi summer. Um, obviously, we do all like precautions with, uh, and this starts already when developing a smart contract with uh, like security considerations around uh, how code is developed, the documentation around it. Then obviously the, the audits where every new version is uh, multiple times audited. Also, we did formal verification for the initial base contracts. We now do it for every future uh, update we do again. Um, there's like a bug bounty of one million for, for critical bugs. Luckily, no one <laughs> got it so far. <laughs> and um, yeah, we also have a, a honeypot safe. So whenever we do a new version, there's like a safe with tons of assets that has upgraded the first before we even uh, like have others or try to, to implement it in our solutions, for example. Um, there's many, many things we do, but I think the most uh, critical part for security is still uh, the Lindy effect of the smart contract. Because every day that passes where the contract is not hacked and there's so much value on it, the more, the better I sleep at night <laughs> because the, the, it's just this, this huge honeypot. And I would say if it hasn't been hacked so far, the likelihood just decreases over time that it that there is really this big issue, but you can never exclude it. But I I, I sleep better now. Well, well, that's good to know that uh that's uh it's not too active of a concern for you in terms of not being constantly worried about it because all those things do help. Um, I, I do want to talk about uh, centralization risk of now everything being because uh, you kind of brought up the honeypot piece here. It is true the more amount of as is there, the more attractive it is for somebody to now have an incentive to try to figure out a way to break it or go around it. But uh, security aside, um, do you feel like things are still aligned with the self-custody and decentralization piece if everything feels like it's managed by the same code? Is that sort of against the value of centralization or decentralization? Um, how do you kind of think about that? Yeah. It's a good question and also not a very linear answer as well because uh, i mean to some extent we are also trusting like the, the protocol code like there's also some some aspect of centralization like ethereum like if there's some issue on the protocol level we're also like fucked in a sense <laughs> and uh so, so there's there's that where like a, a good good kind of interpretation of centralization is also a standard like if we get safe to be uh, getting so much traction that we say might be even worth putting it like in, on the protocol level because anyways there's so much value already or like this uh, this becomes a de facto standard 
uh, then that, that would have the benefit of if something breaks, then it's a break against the protocol. It's not a smart contract hack, and this would be able to be handled differently. Not, not sure if we ever get there. Um, that's one aspect. And the other one is also like decentralization could also mean fragmentation because I, I see a danger with uh, account abstraction where suddenly there's a lot of teams looking into uh, the benefits of smart accounts and a lot of wallets, seeing like how can we leverage that and provide better security and usability to users. Um, mm -hmm. the, the worst case scenario is if now every wallet is going to build their own smart account. Um, because one important property of web free accounts is that you that they're portable. So you can create an account in MetaMask and then you can use the same account via Ledger or via Trust or any other wallet that you want. And this this is for me also the power of, of Web3 where you're not tied to one solution. And there there's this risk, I'm not sure if it's how it's gonna play out, but there's this risk that uh, when we have too much fragmentation in smart accounts that then we lose this important property of knowing I can use the same account everywhere and the, the tooling build around it works for, for all accounts. Um, so I would actually advocate for, and that's what SAFE is essentially building, um, having a, a smart account standard as a, as a modular uh, kind of framework where like all the wallets can build upon and can use the same secure core, which is proven over time um, but is extensible and can allow wallets to build their own experiences with it, can build their own uh, kind of flavors of, of safe. Um, and then we balance this, this kind of value of having uh, like a standard, having like a shared layer with, with the flexibility of still everyone being able to build their own solution on top of that. Uh, yeah. uh, this is interesting because my, my, my next question would have been, do you kind of see yourself more as a product or a protocol? But it seems like you're leaning towards a protocol. So ooh, I mean, it could be both, uh, as I don't want to speak for you. But how, in what you just said, how is it broken down into the, these different layers that you're referring to? So safe as a mod, like the safe core, that's just a asset custody piece and everything else is an extension around it? Or what's a better way of understanding how the protocol is structured? Mm. I mean, yeah, definitely safe started as a product. Uh, no question around this, like we, like the smart contracts were one thing that enabled uh, the, the user interface to leverage multi-signature and, and other features. Um, but then we, we, we saw over time where like our interface allowed to have certain interactions with the safe smart account and use it to interact with tabs and such, um, but it couldn't be optimized for everyone's needs. And then we had other teams, the first ones were actually Alex van der Sande built uni login on, on safe. And then we had uh, CoinShift and, and Parcel as like treasury management solutions being built on safe. And there were all these different uh, solutions popping up that leveraged the underlying smart contracts, but built very optimized solutions on top. And that's where we realized like this is much more than just a product. Uh, it, it can be kind of the, yeah, the, the underlying custody protocol for, for all kinds of accounts out there. And that's where we started shifting from like also pushing our own UI to becoming an ecosystem and figuring out ways how we can support other developers to, to build on safe, to build their own smart wallets, to build treasury management solutions, uh, different kinds of, of experiences on top. Um, and so we now launched earlier this year, uh, safe core, which is really the, the entirety of these developer tooling that, that we've built over the last years. Um, so that's uh, obviously the, the contracts, the protocol, and uh, uh, then some, some infrastructure like an indexer, signature collection service that's needed for that. Um, and yeah, also some SDKs that allow you to take advantage of those. Um, so yeah, s s since then it's clear that the future of SAFE is gonna be uh, this infrastructure uh, layer being this modular smart account and just supporting others to, to build on that. No, this is super cool because uh, it just also ties in with something you just said, which is around other uh, wallets doing smart accounts or smart contract uh, sort of based approaches to receiving addresses. Did you mean that originally from the context of without the standardization of safe core, everybody will have their own implementation and that's when you get inconsistencies across different chains? Or do you think there are other issues, even if everybody switches from EOAs to 
a smart account? Like, what's a good way of understanding that better? And how does that tie into what account extraction is, as most people know it, as of recently? Yeah, it's, it's maybe a good point to bit clarify also how we see account abstraction in general. Um, because it, it's a term that's thrown a lot in, in the last months, and it's a too technical term because it doesn't mean too much for regular people. But the idea about account abstraction is that we have this big problem in the Web3 ecosystem where most accounts out there are just controlled by a private key, where like you have a seed phrase which controls all your assets on, on your wallet. Um, and this is extremely limiting because it's a, it's a very binary logic. You have the private key, you can do whatever you want on the account. You don't have the private key, you cannot access your funds. Or worst case, someone else has the private key and they have access. Um, and so it's, it's, it's very clear that smart accounts which is put that logic from, from the protocol layer to the, to the smart contract layer where you then have the uh, programmability. Everything you can program in Solidity you can have as the logic behind your, your account. Um, this enables so much more flexibility for developers to create uh, more secure accounts, more flexible accounts that have different access control policies and, uh, and, and such. Um, can you give me a couple of examples of what kind of new features will be enabled with that kind of abstraction? Yeah, I mean the traditional ones are like recovery, recovery systems. So what happens if you lose your private keys? Even if you, if you have multiple private keys as a multisig, chances are at sometimes you might uh, mad news forget where you have them or like uh, I don't know, um, and then smart accounts allow to have these fallback mechanisms where you can. Uh, go such as uh, so social recovery, where you maybe have a group of friends that can give you back access to your account, or custodial recovery, where you have a trusted third party, be it an insurance, notary, bank, wh whoever you trust, uh, that can give you access to, to your account. And I think this is going to be quite important for, for mass adoption as well, because like most people are pretty scared of self-custody. Um, and there's a few people out there that probably can do the, the OPSEC and can handle keys and everything that it's not a big problem, but for 99% of people, it's it's super scary. Just saying, if you don't have your keys anymore, all your money is gone. Um, so recovery is, is a huge thing. Mm. Others is uh, sponsored transactions or in general, abstracting gas away from the user. Because what you can do with, with smart accounts is that you have a relay mechanism that uh, takes a transaction that doesn't pay any transaction fees, and the relayer pays for these transaction fees. Uh, and then you just have maybe some agreement with this relayer or uh, some mechanisms how they actually have the incentive to do so. And this can enable use cases like ADAPT sponsoring all the transactions that interact with a certain protocol for the user. Uh, it enables use cases like um, not not having to pay in the native currency of the blockchain, but in like a stable coin. Any token that you have. For example, also very interesting what Gelato is doing there where they have this, uh, they call it one balance, where you have just one gas tank, uh, can be in USDC, and then you can pay with that gas tank your transaction fees on any, any blockchain out there. Um, and this just, yeah, there's, there's very nice kind of gas abstraction use cases that can be done there. Um, other things are just new signature schemes. Uh, so going to quantum secure uh, signature schemes, hopefully at some point, like this requires the smart accounts to have this this flexibility. Uh, but yeah, I think the, the that's enough to actually see the potential of like, you basically get a whole way to interact with a transaction before it gets broadcasted. Um, is We've seen account abstraction become really popular in the last six to eight months. Um, most people know it as ERC-4337. Does what SAFE do for account abstraction the same thing here? Are we talking about different standards? What's kind of the difference between what you have done or do right now versus what people know what account abstraction is? That's actually quite funny because so many people come to me also at EVE Global Hackathons and ask me, so... Now with 4.57, there's no need for safe anymore, right? <laughs> but it's actually uh, quite the opposite because what 4.57 does is solve one aspect or one issue of account abstraction. So with smart accounts, like there can be any 
kind of validation logic, but still the transaction needs to be put on chain. And uh, especially if it's not native account abstraction, where the, the blockchain can accept these smart account transactions, you still need a relaying mechanism to do this. And what 457 does is just have like a specification and a standard around a decentralized relayer mechanisms that enable smart account transactions to be put on chain. Um, so like when there's like blog posts or tweet threads about 457, it always, they always go into detail like what 457 enables with like recovery and sponsored transactions and all of that. And, but the logic of that is still in the smart account, like 457 solves the relay Stop. part of it. Right. Um, but these things need to be put together. Every 457 account is a smart account. So safe is 457 compatible with the latest version as well. Meaning that these, yeah, ideally you use those two synergetically. Um, but yeah, and that's helpful. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty big, uh, point that people need to consider because you're effectively enabling more smart accounts to function with all their, their full functionality. Um, another interesting thing you said, which I want to dive into is you kind of mentioned that it started as a product and now it's more of a protocol. You have kind of already broken down what the protocol is on different layers of the, the stack and how things interact with each other. How do you think about sustainability for the growth of safe and future features or how you think about security as you kind of get bigger or accommodate for more feature requests? What does that world look like and, and what's kind of your lens on this? So sustainability, I, I think about like, uh, I want SAFE to be a project that's around in 50 years, 100 years. Uh, and how can we achieve that? How can we have this, this ecosystem that's built around the SAFE contracts be thriving and, uh, yeah, incentivized? Um, and also here, I want to make a, a strong point because with sustainability and, and these topics, usually the topic of fees comes up. And I think what's really critical about SAFE is we, uh, I think there's like, there should not be any fees within the safe smart accounts itself. So no custody fees or transaction fees, even though a lot of people always say, just do like a custody fee. That's how all, co all custodians work. That's a uh, huge potential there to fund the project into the future. But I think this is the, the wrong way to go. I see the, the safe smart account more as a library, as something open source, everyone can use it. It shouldn't have any modernization as part of that. Um, but still on top of this uh, smart account, there will be like a, a thriving ecosystem of different stakeholders of different participants um, that can range from developers building modules, which I mentioned before, this modularity of, of the safe that add additional features to safe. It can range from uh, like entities providing infrastructure such as indexers or, or such. Um, or, yeah, and, and especially for, for modules, I think it's going to be interesting where, like, most people trust the this, this core of the safe contracts. Like this, with, with like the Lindy effect and everything, like, you don't want to mess with that. Pretty, pretty much everyone <laughs> trusts that. But people don't really trust uh, these plugins, these modules. Um, so how can we incentivize the, the right parties to bring trust to these modules? How can we provide a protocol that gives security guarantees that uh, incentivize people to look at these modules and uh, give attestations that these are like a uh, proper bug free, uh, maybe even have some like insurance or some kind of bond behind it that, or some mechanisms that uh, enable you to have peace of mind using these modules. And I think this is going to be quite interesting way to keep this ecosystem sustainable by creating these incentives for the different parties involved there, because it, yeah, uh, it's, it's auditors, it's maybe insurance providers, it's module developers that need to be. This is an interesting point because you're saying that you want to have a mechanism for the safe ecosystem for these plugins, but without contradicting or rather taking away the choice of these plugins to monetize, even if they chose to do a fee model uh, for their own services. Um, is that kind of the goal where you kind of do it compatibly or is that the intent that you, 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 I understand how it enables a more robust, safe system, but uh, safe uh, plugin ecosystem. But um, how does that help with the sustainability of safe? Because 
it's easier to understand these plugins help make the plugin sustainable because they have a business model now. Yeah. I mean, I don't have the perfect answer there, but I, That's why I, was I, I imagine that, that there should be a way for users to, to opt into a, this secure plugin uh, ecosystem um, where they also have the se security that if something goes wrong with one of these plugins, that there's some automated mechanisms that maybe disables the module or, or something like this. Um, and there's then entities or maybe the user is willing to pay for that. Maybe there's like insurance providers that are willing to provide a, have a package around this, uh, that, that they say, if something happens, actually someone else is, is covering uh, for that. And there's many kind of things we're, we're thinking about. I'm not sure we have the end solution right now, but I think we need, we need to bring trust to these modules because otherwise, uh, like every module has to start from scratch, building up this yes. trust themselves. Like the, the 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 ability to trust the core doesn't benefit anybody because now they have to think about added risk. So um, no, that's a really good point, and I agree. What um, in terms of kind of uh, obviously your the, the spin out from mostly safe to safe is is quite recent. You're figuring out what what it means to kind of grow the community and how you want to think about all these things. What is kind of your hopes for this ecosystem growth uh, on top of SAFE and kind of how, how can people get involved in, in the SAFE ecosystem? Yeah, um, there's definitely the, the call to all dApps and, and wallets out there that come talk to us. We want to find ways how we can provide value to you, how, we, how SAFE smart accounts can be a solution and you don't have to reinvent the wheel and build your own smart account, but maybe more for people that want to just contribute to the to the ecosystem um yeah i mean we have uh, a forum which allows you to to participate in, in discussions and governance where this ecosystem is going but also there's uh, a grants program coming up and what's what's important there we don't just want to fund builders building on top of safe uh, that's one aspect one one of our three pillars um, but also we want to support people that help us with educating people about the, uh, the capabilities of smart accounts and general account abstraction. Uh, as so well. What are the three pillars? You, you mentioned there are a uh, few pillars for the grants. So, yeah. That's specifically for the grants program? The three ones okay. are, are build, educate, and research. So building, obviously, for developers, educate more for the marketers out there, and uh, research then. There's a lot of like still unsolved issues around smart accounts, like 457 partially solved the relaying part, but there's like hundreds of other issues that we need to solve. One particular one is maybe like how do smart accounts interact in a, in a multi-chain landscape? Uh, because each of these accounts is a deployed contract on a new chain um, that creates issues with uh, states being different between these accounts or the addresses potentially being, being different, which people are used to their MetaMask account. Stays the same as long as they have the private everywhere. Key. Um, so that's what, one thing which definitely we should do some research on. Um, but yeah, like again, like build, educate, research. If you want to contribute in any of these ways, uh, look out for this this grants program. Awesome. Um, my last question to you before we uh, we end this: What would you like to see people build on top of Safe that you haven't seen yet? One for sure is uh, more more retail solutions because we, we need to get rid of this stigma of safe just being a DAO tooling just being team solution and there's there's some solutions out there like nest wallet like uh, linen wallet uh, even like world app that targeting more retail individual users like these things will have much more potential probably in the future because the awareness is not there yet too much so that this uh, there's a more uh, growth happening and then maybe more specifically, when we look at SAFE being this modular smart account framework, like one of the, the, the type of modules you can build there are guards. These are like uh, hooks that each transaction goes through and, and checks certain transactions, certain requirements. Um, so it can be like a allow deny list where you say my account can only interact with these types of contracts. Um, but it can also be something like uh, Security checks, like you can you can build a risk like checks with that talk to things outside the chain, outside of, like, outside, outside like uh, off chain, like yes, for example, other... off chain, like you can have an off chain 
like risk assessment solution that then puts on chain attestations and says this transaction it's good good to go this is maybe uh, like double check it or like have another kind of confirmation from the user to to put it through and this like obviously a scam like block this transaction uh, like you can do very cool things uh, around that um, and then maybe finally around recovery I think people always when they hear recovery and maybe this is also like Vitalik is a big fan of social recovery and is pushing this notion of how we we end up recovering our accounts but I think this is going to be one of many solutions. So think about new novel ways to to recover your account, whether that's some like cool things you could do is like you have multi-sig, so you have multiple keys, multiple devices that control your account. But over time, if there's no interaction with the account, the threshold goes down. So if you lose maybe a few of your keys and you cannot get the threshold anymore, after a month you can get it again or like it kind of Gives you this full really interesting concept, yeah. Like you can do so many cool things around recovery there. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, Lucas, thank you so much for this amazing chat. And uh, hopefully we get to see how we can make custodying even simpler and better for everybody else in this space. Thank you.